like to do. Well, thank you once again. As you know, we... Uh, let me see if I have that slide of our... Okay, very good. I must tell you that this morning I was very much constrained because I was told you have a half an hour and I had two hour presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's so much more to share and so much more to talk about. We here we're just scratching the surface really. Uh, you can go so much more in depth on those issues and uh, it's, it's beneficial, it was beneficial to me was that it was beneficial to me and and many of my students so yesterday we looked at the history of ordination by the way I talked to Carolyn and uh, I I will make my two papers available that have all the information plus much more than what you having here what you will have here so two papers the first one was presented in January last year and second one in July last year okay so uh, what I'm going to present to you today it's a bit of a discussion on uh, plus uh, extra on what I presented to the thought to the task to the theology of ordination study committee. So we looked yesterday at the problem of ordination. We, we found out, and this is my conviction, ordination does not exist in the New Testament. So of question instantly you have: w What have we been arguing about all those years? If it does not even exist in the New Testament, okay? So that's that's the thing. Doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong, okay? We could adjust the whole idea of ordination and have it right. All right, I think everybody can be ordained, right? I don't have a problem with this. This morning we look at the problem of authority. Oh, we did this morning. And, and this is a huge issue. I'll touch on it again. I think that if we really understood what Jesus was all about, it would solve not just this problem. I mean, notice how this issue of authority that I talked this morning can actually help marriages, can help parents-children relationships, okay, can help relationship within the church if we follow Jesus you know I'm learning myself on this issue I've got a teenage daughter 15 years old and she's testing us and the older she is the more I'm submitting to her isn't it something when she was a little child we told her what to do to shape her okay now that she's beginning to make her own decisions she'll be 16 this year we actually submitting to her in, a, in various ways to let her grow as a Christian and, and that's a natural way, way of thinking. If you had kids who are 25 and they still submit to you, there's something wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you want them to go, you know? <laughs> and, and be good citizens, good Christians, and so on. That's the whole purpose of parenting. If this is purpose of parenting, why are we requiring this of our wives to be underneath forever for under men? It just doesn't make any sense, you know? If you frame this problem of authority, it is, it's whole, all our discussions in the church, within the framework of what I gave today during the sermon, I think many problems would disappear. One last problem I would like to address is the problem of male headship. This is a new problem in our church. It's not an Adventist problem, and I'll address the issue where it came from. But this whole idea of male headship raised its ugly head during the last Theology of Ordination Study Committee. And, and uh, some people, they will not succeed, but some people are trying to make this one of our fundamentals. Okay, so, so they will not succeed, I don't think, but uh, because it's not an Adventist problem, not an Adventist issue. So we're going to take a look at this from a great controversy perspective. Okay, so there will be a little bit of repetition, but I cut so much out of my sermon that I probably will not repeat myself. So we'll see. Okay. All right, ordination and authority, it's all, th I mean, this is it, ordination and authority, okay? The question of authority, what are we doing here? Are we, are we raising those people to a higher level of ranking of kinds, or are we actually recognizing the gift of servanthood? Okay, so I think we missed the boat on this one, that's my personal opinion. And uh, in recent years, I mean, recent hundred years or so, the issue of authority received quite a fair amount of attention in our church and as we increasingly become concerned with issues of order, organization, ranking, policy, all the while trying to be attempt, uh, attempting to be faithful to scripture. Why is that so? It's because, well, Jesus did not come yet. And the longer we wait, the more we'll be concerned about the issues of policy, order, ranking and all this kind of stuff. So uh, the issue of authority has resurfaced, especially with the discussion on women's ordination. 
And the most sensitive questions that people have been asking are this. Should women be ordained and thus lead in the church through preaching, teaching, baptizing, ministry? I know this is not the question that your church is asking, but many people out there are asking that question. Would not such an action place them in headship position over their male counterparts? So we've got this big word headship. When I bring this word headship, see this is what I wanted to do in, during the sermon, have this big red letters authority, headship. What comes to mind? Is it a nice concept and pleasant? And everybody feels like wonderful headship. I'll be submitting or something. Is this a nice concept? You know, for, for the most, it works in the business world. Some uh, that depends that now people are redefining what the business models are. Okay, but but certainly it's a difficulty to work in a marital relationship. As I told you the story about about Baptist missionaries, those women really really struggled. They they read in the scripture that they are help meet and they didn't know what it means. How can they do this? So all for, for two years that my wife participated in the circle of, uh, of those women, evangelical women, the discussion was what does it mean for my husband to be the head? What does it mean for me to submit? And really, nobody knows. There's no answer to that question. Okay, there's a variety of answers. How, how can husband exercise his headship? How, how the wife should submit and so on. Everybody in that camp has a different answer to the question. Okay, so in our circles, it, it, uh, I mean, of course, and headship is not a positive concept. Okay, if we frame it within the framework of the world, if we frame it within the framework of the scriptures, even Paul, okay, so when I, when I started studying Paul when I was young, I thought he was a misogynist. He didn't like women or what, Paul. but then I realized, and we can't touch on it today, Paul was revolutionary, absolutely revolutionary. Just think about it, just one example, okay? The very fact that he's saying that women should be silent in the church from our perspective, this is kind of restrictive, right? But when you think from Paul's perspective, the very fact that women were in the church was revolutionary. It was a complete revolution. To this day, when I, I went to Israel a couple of years ago, I went to this famous synagogue, Huvra in Jerusalem, just rebuilt, completed in 2010. I was sitting, all men, women were nowhere to be seen. Nowhere. Okay, so they still have those, those things of, of understanding of headship and so on. So what are the answers to the question? That, that's the interesting part that I discovered. In the camp of those who don't believe women should, uh, should pastor churches and so on, women should be ordained, everybody has a different answer what women can do. There's not one uniform, uh, uniform answer to the question. So some would say, Women should never be placed in any position that would situate them in authority over men. And you, you, you think, okay, church, well, all right, church is one thing, but what about university? What about when there are women lecturers in university? I have a colleague in, a, uh, in my department who is a woman, and she teaches over men. So, so, how, so, so some people say, all right, no, we can't have women in any position of authority. If they want to teach, they have to teach just females, not males. It's it just can't be. And number two, all leadership positions are open, but not in the local church. Right? That's another answer. Okay? You can do whatever you like, but not in the local church. So uh, local church, you can, women have, can preach and teach, but there has to be male figure to oversee everything. Another answer would be all positions, but there must be a senior pastor above. All right. I think in this position we've got everything solved because we've got general conference president. He's above all. So what's the discussion? It's all about I don't know. But but uh, th that's just a joke. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So so uh, various responses uh, to those uh, questions. What women can do and and nobody knows. Okay. Nobody knows what women can. How far do we go? Everybody has a different answer. The common denominator for all those position position is. This, the position of spiritual headship, quote unquote, in the church must be reserved to men alone. But what does that mean? Nobody knows. Okay, we, we just there's no discussion. The discussion is no women in ministry. But what does it mean that this? There's just no clear answers on that. On this, remember what I told you during the sermon. Everything that we do in the church 
should be, lo uh, should be looked through the prism of what Jesus said to us. And for me, this, this not so with you provides a huge framework of what ministry, what leadership, what relationship in the church should be. For the people who oppose women's ordination, this is the framework. They read 1 Timothy 2.12, no woman shall have authority over men, and they basically read this into everywhere. Okay, they make this a foundational capstone and they, they read it over I into everything. Uh, but, but what do you do with this? What does it mean women shall have no authority? There are good explanations for this. I, I, I may touch on this if we have a moment because the word authority here is a very interesting word. It's not any kind of teaching authority. It's a kind of a, uh, authority that is uh, oppressive. Okay, authority that basically you tell somebody what to do. So he says, no woman shall have authority over men like this, but by implication, men should not have this kind of authority either. If you read through the perspective of what Jesus said, not so with you, okay? Not many people do this. So ordination in the minds of those people is believed to raise a particularly gifted man to a position of authority in the church. The moment you lay hands, suddenly up in ranks, okay? And as I explained in my sermon, this is a completely foreign concept as far as Jesus is concerned. This is a, it came to us from other, other places. So since by the Bible speaks of male headship alone, the position of senior pastor, sen uh, senior, uh, senior pastor, got a mistake there, or elder is close to women. Okay? The position of a senior pastor, senior elder is basically closed uh, to women, limited to men alone. And as we had seen in a sermon, the word authority is a strange word. It can mean this, mostly it means this. Okay, one word, two different conceptions. One is secular world conception, and this one is Jesus conception, which we need to incorporate into, uh, into, uh, into our Christian experience. Okay, so I have questions, all right? I definitely believe that this, what I just showed you, is wrong. I have no questions about it, okay? Th this is wrong because Jesus said, not so with you, all right? Just simple test. Many people believe that when you go to elders' office, you, you are rank outranking other people in the church. Jesus said, not so with you, okay? Jesus talks about slavery and about uh, servanthood. That was his, his thing. So where did the wrong ideas of authority come from, okay? I isolated four sources. Uh, first of all, it's sinful human nature. I mean, it's in us that, that we want to dominate. It's just, I don't know how it works, but ev I, I like to say this, in every one of us there's a little Hitler. <laughs> Depending on the circumstances. You may be quite nice people right here, but if time or circumstances start to squeeze you out, then this is the real test of your character, okay? Like, for example, in Poland, I grew up with uh, the stories of Auschwitz. Have you heard about Auschwitz? Okay, this is in southern Poland, where many millions of Jews perished in, in gas uh, chambers and, and were burned and so on. And uh, I've always asked myself a question when I was young. How come a small group of German soldiers was able to keep there are thousands of people in a camp in order, and everybody was afraid. All right? why, don't, why didn't those people just rebel, all right, and just, just run all those soldiers and they'd be gone? Okay, so German, the Nazis, not, I would like to make the distinction today, this distinction today, the Nazis came up with a devilish plan. And the plan was that they put people in barracks of 40 to 50 people and put one prisoner in charge. And they rewarded the prisoner, okay, to keep order. If if, and they made promises to the prisoner, and if that prisoner fulfilled what the German wanted them to do, they he would be rewarded and uh, maybe freed or something. And what they did, they didn't put simple, quote-unquote, people in position, they put educated people. Teachers, lawyers, doctors, people who had good education, people who, were, who had status in a society. And you know what happened? Those people who were in the barracks and in prison, they hated those people more than they hated Nazis. Uh, it, the ne technical name with which I grew up for those people was Kapo. Okay, you may have heard this, Kapo. When Allied forces came to, to release those prisoners at the end of war, 
prisoners didn't go under na after Nazis, they went after Kapos and they, and they just, just demolished them, okay? The thing is, those were good people, educated, good people. And, and I realized in every one of us, okay, depending on the situation, depending on the circumstances, we have it in our nature to dominate over others, right? We, if, if, if there's good life, no problem. But if there's problems, who knows, okay? So sinful human nature, this is, this is just in us. That, that we, uh, we just dr are drawn to wrong models of authority. What Jesus is saying to us is completely unnatural. It's, it's not where we want to go, okay? Secondly, pagan philosophy and modern society, we're not going to spend much time on it, but attitude towards women began with Plato, Aristotle, with the, with the pagans, inf infiltrated Christianity in the second, third, and fourth century. Uh, society was structured according to this. It was a Hellenistic society. This is a quote from Plato. Do you not... Do you then know of anything practiced by human beings in which the male sex is not superior to the female in all aspects? The one sex is truly surpassed in everything by the other. This is Plato. Aristotle was even worse, okay? So, so they gave this kind of philosophy into society and Christianity started drinking this and that's what happened. That's why Tertullian and others, you saw the quotes yesterday, went after, after women. That's part of it. Then Roman Catholic tradition, I'll address it in a moment. And finally, something we don't talk about, Christian fundamentalism. As it happened, uh, I've been teaching this stuff uh, for quite a number of years now, but Gary Chad Chadley, what's his name? He just published recently on Spectrum website an article about fundamentalism. Very good article, okay? I encourage you to read this because he, he speaks the truth in there as far as fundamentalism is concerned, okay? I'll give you some other information that he does not have here. But all of this, for me, represents a counterfeit understanding of authority, okay? All of those four points represent this. And Jesus is the one who calls us to this, all right? In my classes, I let this rot really badly. So by when I teach once a week, by the third week, it stinks, you know? And people run, this is a stinking smell of wrong kind of authority. Okay, so there you go. So this is counterfeit. So I produced a little diagram here. This is on, on the front page of my paper. I did present this to, uh, to the committee. And this is what I'd like to show you today, okay? Basically how it works. We've got on the right hand side, we've got New Testament Christianity. On the left hand side, we've got post apostolic Christianity. Notice one thing that this side points to Christ, this side points away from Christ. And we have a spread at the bottom, which I call the great controversy theme, as I presented to you in the sermon, okay, today, that basically on this side, this side there, we have a counterfeit understanding of authority. This is the true understanding of biblical authority, okay? One points to Christ, one points away from Christ. And I'm going to address points one by one, A, B, C, D, just like my paper is structured, okay? So... I believe that the post-apostolic church represents a counterfeit view of authority. And there are certain characteristics of that counterfeit view of authority. And number one is it is hierarchical. In other words, it is conceived in terms of order, ranking, or chain of command, clergy above laity. All right? This is just basically a clear picture of a hierarchy. This simply means that we have a one pastor controlling all activities such as baptism, Lord's Supper, administration. He is in charge. Without the pastor, nothing can happen. He has the final say in all affairs of the church. As you know, Adventism doesn't work like this because we have a church board. And church board can override the pastor, right? But this is the movement towards this kind of counterfeit view of authority is that nobody can override the pastor. He's the boss. Okay, so he's controlling everything, and that's what that's happened already. That happened already in the second and third century. Uh, submission to the pastor is expected. Okay, there's just no other way to do. It. You submit, uh, and that's it. Okay, it already happened in Ignatius, as as we noticed yesterday. You submit, don't no questions asked. Pastor is placed in the position of God, and that's it. Okay, so so this is. Uh, and it's of course it is based on the way Roman Empire was governed because it just happened that the Christians like Tertullian and others they were looking 
to build bridges between society and between the church, trying to make church reasonable to the society. So what they're going to do? They're going to make the church look like the society. So that when people come to the church, they feel at home. And that's exactly what happened. Okay, so the structures, pagan government structures were incorporated into Christianity and they still today, as far as uh, we can see in Roman Catholicism. Okay, so the next point is sacramental. We also addressed this yesterday. This uh, simply means that the spiritual life of believers and thus their salvation in some way depends on the pastor. Okay, this is what sacramental actually means. That in order to have salvation, you have to have pastor in the church. And yesterday we discovered that Adventist church would survive without the pastors. So why are we arguing about ordination? If we could get rid of all the pastors, we would still have church. Because God distributes gifts of leadership everywhere. So, okay? so somebody else would pick up. In Catholicism, no, you have to be duly ordained. And that's what it means, sacramental. Okay? And because you are ordained, you're placed on a higher level than the rest of of the congregation. Catholics believe in priesthood of all believers. Okay? They believe in priesthood of all believers, but they say there are two ways of priesthood of all believers. There's priesthood of all believers for common believers, and there's priesthood of all believers for uncommon believers, who are clergy. Okay? They're on higher level. All are equal, but they're on higher level. Okay? So, so that's, that's what it is. The spiritual life depends on the pastor. So this is another second one. Uh, second uh, characteristics of a counterfeit view of authority. A pastor becomes a type of an Old Testament priest. And priests, of course, we're talking about mediation. In order to go to God, you have to go through the pastor. Okay? Definitely a counterfeit model because, because Jesus is our only mediator. He is the only one to whom we go. By faith, okay, we go to Christ. We don't need hu another human being. Another human can help us but not through the human being. Okay, you know the difference, okay? So that's what it is. So a pastor becomes a type of Old Testament priest. And this is where the church actually stitched up the curtain that was rent apart, okay, in, uh, in the system, uh, Levitical system. So ordination authorizes the pastor to administer baptism or Lord's Supper. Now, this is an interesting point. In our church, we also practice the same thing, that only ordained pastor okay, or elder should administer baptism or other, other rites. Okay? We practice it for different reasons. In our church, we do it because of order. In the Catholic Church, like the sacramental model, they do it because it works only if the pastor does it. Baptism will not work unless ordained pastor do it. Okay, so in that, in that system, you have to have duly ordained pastor to, to do it. But the problem is here, we have the same rule. Okay, so when you've got people coming into the church and they never study what the church is, what the role of ministry is, they will come up with this kind of mentality. All right, only pastor can ordain because only pastor can baptize because it will not work if anybody will baptize or, or something like this. And, and we're essentially incorporating... We, we're preaching against Sunday, we're preaching against immortality soul, but we're buying into ecclesi Catholic ecclesiology and bringing it into the church without even asking questions because we don't know what questions to ask. Okay, so this is, this is the problem. The same, same thing, but different reasons, but they conflate in the end. So, ordained ministry is necessary for the existence of the church as we had seen yesterday. It is essential. We can't have the church without ordained ministry. All right, the next one. It's elitist, okay? All this sacramental, hierarchical creates an elite in the church. So we've got two classes of individuals. They are called clergy and laity, which goes back to Tertullian, as you had seen yesterday. It is not a biblical distinction, never found in the Bible, but goes back to Tertullian. And ordination confers a special kind of divine authority upon a person. And because of that, uh, the church becomes, and all the, only those ordained can provide spiritual leadership in the church, all right? The church recognizes the this, this spiritual uh, gifting and only those people can provide spiritual leadership to the church. So we've got some kind of a hierarchy here that in order to get to God, you have to go through ministry, okay? There's just no other, no other way. Uh, so essentially, the church is a community of unequals, 
Okay, so this was clearly ref reflected in the First Vatican Council's uh, document on the Church. And this was in 1870 where Catholics wrote this. The Church of Christ is not a community of equals in which all the faithful have the same rights. It is a society of unequals, not only because the, among the faithful some are clerics and some are laymen, but particularly because there is in the church the power from God, whereby to some it is given to sanctify, teach and govern, and to others is not. Okay, this is a powerful statement of Catholic theology. But you go to, to a small Adventist church somewhere out there in, in mission fields, and there will be exactly the same ecclesiology expressed. Like actually, they live by this. Many people do live by this, that, well, so church is not a society of equals, okay? And I've even heard that the Tosk from some papers, church is not a society of equals. It's like, you know, today in our Adventist church, uh, those who oppose women's ordination, they, they recognize that we, we, it's politically incorrect uh, to, to say that women are not equal to men. It's kind of like against the Protestant ethos and, and so on. So now they're saying that men are equal to women, but only men are gifted with, with gifts of leadership. But they're equal, they, they're all equal and so on. And that reminds me of George Orwell. Have you ever read The Animal Farm? Okay, I came up, came up from a communist country. So when I read Animal Farm, uh, first time in Australia after I learned to speak English, I could relate to this. And remember what, what he says, the one famous statement, all are equal, but some are more equal than others. <laughs> okay, so we essentially, in Adventist church, are teaching this kind of ideology. We're all equal, when men and women are equal, but some are more equal than others, okay? Well, deja vu, right? <laughs> so, uh, the fourth point, this is the most important point, okay? Uh, this, is, uh, this is what... Understanding this actually gave me an amazing tool, okay? Uh, amazing tool to, to really research the origin of male headship in Christianity. Uh, and this is, this is what I connected only within the last two, three years that the connections came to me. I studied Catholic Church all those years and I did not see it. I knew about this, but I did not connect it to our current discussion. The final point, there's more of them, but I, I isolated four, of a counterfeit view of authorities oriented towards male headship in the church. So basically, all Christians, this is, uh, this is how it goes, this is the reasoning of this thing. All Christians, teach that all Christians teach that Christ is the head of the church, including Roman Catholic Church. However, however, okay, the church in the second, third, fourth, fifth century was faced with a physical absence of Christ. Therefore, a need arose in the minds of some thinkers that we need to replace Christ's presence on earth. How are we going to do this? Okay? Somebody who, who takes his place, who represents him to believers, and who represents believers to God. So, Christian believers, early Christian ministers, assumed the position of headship in the place of Christ. And it was ordination that actually did it. Okay, once you were ordained, you assumed a headship position in the church. Headship in place of Christ. So, pastor now X, this is a classic Catholic term, in persona Christi capitis, which simply means in the person of Christ the head. Alright, so a pastor, bishop replaces Christ in a community. So that's what it means, acts in persona in persona Christi Capitus. What is the reasoning behind this whole thing? This is really fascinating. Okay, in the New Testament, in the New Testament, the Jesus is represented as a bridegroom and the church is represented as a bride. When you recognize a human being in persona Christi Capitus, in the person of Christ, the head, okay, that person is no longer part of the congregation as such. He's separated. Okay, being representative of Christ, okay, being representative of Christ, he marries the church. Are you with me on this? Okay, Christ married the church, the pastor being representative of Christ, he is also married to the church. So, past, uh, person, the pastor acts in persona Christi Capitis, and because Christ is the bridegroom, the pastor has to be a man. 
he cannot possibly be a woman. So in Catholic Church, ordination, uh, and I, in my paper that you're going to receive from Carl, and I document this, it's, it's a fascinating stuff. Ordination becomes a type of marriage for bishops. They get a ring, they get a kiss, and in official, official ordination, um, ordination documents, it, there's a statement made, now the church is your spouse, or you are spouse of the church. So bishop is actually married to the church. Right? Instead of Christ. It was Christ, but, but he replaces Christ. So the church is a spouse of the pastor. So the marriage metaphor, rather than Christ and the church, it becomes the pastor and the church. All right? So this is the significance of ordination in Catholic church. Many Catholics don't even know it. Okay? I had to dig in quite deeply into this stuff. This, this whole idea developed over the centuries. It was really expressed only during the 10th and 11th centuries. But that's where male headship led. Okay? So ultimately, the model on the left is a counterfeit model. Okay? Hierarchical, sacramental, elitist, male headship oriented. And guess what? Where the people who oppose women's ordination tend to go to. They don't even know it, but this is, this is the, the very model they are gravitating to. And they're beginning to embrace one by one the ideology of Catholic thinking just to prevent women from being ordained in the Adventist church. In one of the papers that I read from, uh, from one who opposes women's ordination, there was a statement if Jesus is in a heavenly sanctuary and he is a man, so his representatives on earth should be men too. <laughs> there was a statement presented to Tosk. Okay? The person does not realize that it's pure Catholicism. Okay? And I've seen those arguments being taken from Catholic Church. That just, they just don't mention they took it where they took it from. But I happen to know. I just happen to know this thing. <laughs> so, so, you know, so that's, that's what I... I presented to them. Okay, now th this is coming back to in contrast, okay, we, we have this, this picture we're going to show now uh, New Testament Christianity uh, points A, B, C and D, A1, B1, C1 uh, and D1, so the critique of the counterfeit model and today during the sermon I, I presented some of this, that Jesus is the head of the church all New Testament teachings, this is a very crucial point that we need to remember uh, as I said, those who oppose women's ordination, they would put, magnify the verse, women shall have no authority, they would interpret everything with this one verse. This is the primary verse, okay? And of course they've got, man is the head of a woman and so on, a complete misunderstanding of what headship is, okay? And they interpret Jesus according to their own glasses, all right? Whereas if you look into Jesus, you see this kind of distinction, and you apply different kind of glasses, you don't see that, what they see. That's a matter of switching glasses, okay? Instead of having rotten glasses, you, you go for healthy stuff. Okay, so here we are, okay? We, we, we went through some of those verses. This is a little bit of a repetition, not so with you. We're talking about servant and doulos. Doulos is a fascinating term, you know? Fascinating term. Slave, you know? Jesus is a slave, okay? He asked us to be slaves. How is that? I, I saw some slaves here today. This is good. This is good church here. Okay. So it, he radically redefines the authority from this to this. And we're still learning the lesson. So diakonos and doulos becomes description of apostolic and subsequent ministry. And here is the verse that I had, I had uh, shown. No, I think it was Holly who read the verse, okay? Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being the very nature of God, made himself nothing, taking the very nature of slave. You tell this to the people who fight for male headship in the church. All right, that's, Jesus says that. They're going to redefine this according to something else, okay? It's a wrong kind of hermeneutics altogether. I think if we followed what Jesus, what Paul told us about this, or about Jesus, what he did, we, we would be all well. So, in the church of Jesus, therefore, it is not an ordination to an office, a title, or a position that makes a leader, but the quality of the person's life and his or her willingness to be the least of all. Okay, so basically, 
what makes a leader? Okay, I mean, I don't have to really explain this clearly because it's, it's obvious, okay? If a pastor comes to the church and he behaves like a, what's the bad word, jerk, right? <laughs> okay, uh, if he behaves kind of like that, uh, is church going to give him authority, any kind of authority? No, th it will look somewhere else, to people within the community who have genuine Christian authority. In our sinful natures, we somehow tend to gravitate to people who, who give us the true Christian authority. It's just, that's how it works, okay? Because they represent Jesus to us. So it is a person's life and his or her willingness to be the least of all. You know, I, told, I read that story to you about my friend Freddy in Tasmania. Okay? A man with four classes of education. Four classes of primary education. Uh, what happened was, I... I had three churches on the north coast of Tasmania and then my middle church had Bible study. So I, I was driving to the Bible study on Tuesday nights and that old gentleman was in his home in my primary church. So I would always take him, grab him into my car and I would just drive with him for 40 minutes to the other church and we'd have a Bible study then I would deliver him back home. You know, I came to those churches from Andrews having newly minted PhD uh, in historical theology uh, and and I, I just, the people were kind of afraid, you know, that they found out that the guy is coming, PhD, or what is he going to do to us, you know, <laughs> well, but uh, that, that drive, 40 minutes one way and 40 minutes back, became the most meaningful time of my entire ministry. That guy preached Christ to me, like nobody ever before, you know, I was completely floored, you know, he taught me more than all my theological education combined. A four classes of basic education that he, he got in the 40s, you know. So he represented a genuine Christian authority more than any pastor that I've known in my life, you know. And he died recently, but I honored him and I still honor him in my mind. So Christian ordination, as I said this morning, is a call to slavery. And I really mean it. Okay, and this is not, uh, when, when we, when I talk about slavery, uh, we have to kind of distinguish uh, this uh, from the perspective that, that, that people don't respect each other. You know, you don't respect that person, because he's a slave, just do anything to him, oh, whatever, walk over him. That's not what we're talking about. This is the mentality of a person who has leadership skills and he's utilizing his or her leadership skills for the benefit of others, not for the benefit of, of uh, themselves. And we all struggle with this, you know. I, I mean, we all do, okay. Uh, pastors like to be liked. You know, that's a normal thing. We're humans, all right. We, we like when you like our sermons, okay. But in reality, the call for me and other pastors should be to, to recognize the the gifting in others, and, and in reality, the less of us, the better. That's the truth, you know? The less of us, the better. A great leader will recognize the gifting of the church members and will push them up, himself going down at the same time. You know? And that's the thing. Many of us pastors tend to feel kind of like, I need to be the one who is recognized. And our system is not the greatest because we recognize people by the number of baptisms. You've got those evangelists who baptize thousands of people and they kind of have this statue, you know. That's not what it's all about, you know. It's a wrong model altogether, in my opinion. Okay, slavery essentially is you recognize, push others, okay. A beautiful, that uh, I cut out of my sermon, a beautiful picture of this appears in 1 Corinthians 4.1. Uh, Paul calls himself a slave or servant and his co-workers are servant, but it's not the word doulos or diakonos, it's the word huperatas. Huperatas, we are the huperatas of Christ. What does it mean? Okay, he's writing to Corinthians. Corinth is like Seattle on a shore. Okay, yesterday I was in the Columbia building and I saw ships coming in. So the Corinthians were sitting kind of on a hill, Acropolis high, and they're looking at the ships coming in. And what kind of ships did they have those days? They had slave galleys. And many of those slave galleys had three rows of oars, okay? And, and Paul says, tells them, look at those ships that are coming by Corinth. I am like the Huperatas. Huperatas is the lowest level of oars. 
That means you've got people above you, okay? And doing all kind of, when you're sitting at the bottom of a ship, it stinks. Okay? Because you're chained to the oars. You can't go anywhere. Okay? You do your stuff where you are and th things drop on you, okay? So that's, that's, he presents himself like that, okay? It's an amazing, amazing thing. It's a call to slavery, really, uh, to understand who we are. Not to authority over, but authority to serve. Christ gives me authority to serve by calling me into ministry. That's it. Okay, ministry is service, all right? So once again, we have this picture here. We're going for the New Testament Christianity. Number one, it was non-hierarchical. Non-hierarchical. What I can say about, about you see, th this is amazing actually, because I read the Bible several times. And I read New Testament, every book several times. And I never saw when this, when I started really digging into this, it was actually an amazing experience. When I realized what Jesus is calling us to do, I did a study a year ago in May, exactly as I was preparing for my presentation. I looked for all the words slave, servant in the New Testament. Mind-boggling. Okay? Not once Paul calls himself servant, but he calls himself slave probably 20 times. And all the other People like James, like others, they call themselves slaves. They call sl servants slaves. Don't consider me highly. I'm just a slave. I'm nobody. Don't put me on a pedestal. I'm nobody. This is the message of the New Testament. I didn't see it before. Okay? But it's there. It's there. It's a lot of, a lo in a lot of places. So it was non-hierarchical. Okay? Special authority of the disciples not passed on. Okay? The disciples are sola scriptura. So what I can see in the New Testament I'm not going to address that point too much, but reverse hierarchy, okay? It's not a hierarchy, one at the top and the rest follow. This one is washing of the feet, okay? The, the leaders are making the things work, okay? Helping, helping the things work, reverse hierarchy. Apostles and the other leaders refer to this themselves as slaves and servants, and this is the word huperatas, okay, in 1 Corinthians 4.1. Check this out, it's an amazing, amazing word. It's a witness of life rather than rank, that gives people a genuine authority. Isn't it true? Witness of life rather than, than rank. So all believers, in, by Paul, this is another beautiful verse, all believers are called to be slaves of one another. But the leaders especially. Okay, we are all called to be slaves of one another. So number one, non-hierarchical. Number two, non-sacramental. I already referred to this. The early post-apostolic church stitched the temple's curtain together. It was, it was rent apart and they just came back and said, ah, oh, forget it. We're going to back and stitch it back again and create, you recreated priesthood in Christianity. All right? So interestingly, interestingly, we as Adventists teach that Christ is our minister in the heavenly sanctuary. It's a biblical uh, teaching there. In Daniel, it says that the sanctuary was thrown down to earth and that's exactly what happened with the Catholic priestly system. Okay? So, so that's, it's non-sacramental. Number three, it's non-elitist. All right? I look at the verse and I cannot read it in any other possible way. Okay? Uh, in Matthew 23, 8 to 13, he said to his followers, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master and you are all brothers. The greatest among you will be your servant. Once again, the theme of Jesus. So when I... When I read this verse, I kind of put other, other pieces into there. And I said, today we would say, but you are not to be called pastor, elder, for you have only one master and you are all brothers. The greatest among you will be your servant. So I kind of moved away from my students on the basis of this, from my students calling me all kinds of funny names like doctor, pastor, elder, whatever. They all call me by my first name. Okay, and that's my rule. I kind of... By my authority, I enforce it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, and my student cherish, cherish this, really. And I love to be called by my first name. So there's no need. You see, any kind of names that we give to each other, they create a division. I often get emails from students and they sign themselves, Pastor so-and-so. Why? What's the point? You know, you just, who you are. We were all servants, Okay. Uh, so the, re the reality is, okay, this is a sentence from my paper, the, re the reality is that if anything apart from the commitment to Christ and his church, spiritual gifting and maturity determines fitness for various functions in the church, then 
whether we intend it or not, we create an elitist society. When gender comes into this, we create an elitist society. <coughs> when women cannot be ordained, men can be ordained, we create elitist society. Okay? And then we, we like to call it spiritual leadership. Spiritual leadership of the men. And in reality, we're baptizing a pagan concept. You know? So, so just adding the word spiritual does not mean it's biblical. Okay? It just, just makes it sound better, you know? But it's not. Okay? So, non elitist. And finally, this is an important one. Okay? It was not, it was not male headship oriented. That means there's no room, no room, there can't be any room for any kind of male headship in the church. Because male headship beyond the home circle, okay, I, I don't have a problem with male headship in the home, but I'll, we have to redefine it, okay, and I'll, I'll talk to you in a moment. Male headship beyond the home circle replaces Christ's spiritual headship in the church. So nuptial language is restricted in the Bible to specific relationship, Christ and his bride, and a husband and his bride. So as the husband is the bride of his wife, so Christ is the head of the church, his bride, okay? So in other words, there's no correspondence between, I mean, there's correspondence between a young man and a young woman and Christ and his bride. This is the big correspondence of the scripture, okay? But some people try to take it further, okay? We'll take this and apply it to the church, and it's illegitimate. You can't do it. Okay, that's why one of the reasons why male headship cannot possibly exist in the church, okay? So, men are not bridegrooms of the church. Are you with me, okay? Men are not bridegrooms of the church. Christ is the only bridegroom. Men are not bridegrooms. Any idea of the uh, headship in the church, be it male or female, apart that from that of Christ, usurps the headship of Christ. Okay? Some people believe we need to ordain women to positions of headship in the church. Wrong. Any kind of headship in the church, apart from Christ, is wrong. Okay? It, it has no place. The church submits only, only to Christ. So, I came to a conclusion, a strong conclusion, that spiritual headship in the church, and especially male headship in the church, is essentially spiritual adultery. That's it. You replace Christ the head with men the head in the church. That's spiritual adultery. And we should not indulge in adultery, right? It's one of the commandments. Okay. <laughs> so, there is no correspondence, okay, between Christ, the bridegroom, men and women, bridegroom and, bride and uh, bridegroom, no correspondence to pastor and the church. Uh, just, just not there. And yet, I, I showed this slide to this slide exactly as you see was shown to the TOSC, to the Theology Ordination Study Committee, in July. In January, they bring male headship on the floor again. <laughs> I said it, it is adultery. <laughs> you know, and it's like, like they didn't hear it, okay? I mean, it's obvious. If something replaced Christ, it's adultery, right? Spiritual adultery. That's what happened in Old Testament. Well, we can talk sometimes and we won't be heard, okay? So, here once again, that's that, that little uh, diagram on the left-hand side is a counterfeit model. On the right-hand side, we have, we have the true one. And uh, I read you the conclusion of, uh, conclusion of my paper on this issue. What I do not present in my paper, so this is my paper that I presented to Tosk in a nutshell. What I do not, uh, what time is it? It's quarter to three. Okay, we st still have some time. Do you need a break? Stand up maybe and, and just uh, move a little bit, wake up? <laughs> well, why don't you? Uh, just, just stand up. All right, let us, let us continue. We still have some time. Okay, so <coughs> this is one origin of male headship idea that seeped into Christianity and, and to Adventism. And uh, up until now, you have everything in my paper. This, is, this, is a little, you, this part is not in my paper, but Gary Chad, Chadley? Chadley, okay, he wrote a good synopsis on this. 
This is just a little extra information, okay? Another source of male headship is Christian fundamentalism. They, of course, in my opinion, got it from Christian tradition, Christian Catholic tradition. What was Christian fundamentalism? It was a movement, and notice the dates, it was a movement that reacted against liberal theology. All right, liberal theology kind of adapted Christianity to enlightenment, and those guys are saying, no, okay, we're going right back. And they, and they kind of become really, really fundamental in, re in their reaction. Notice the dates, 1890s and 1920s, okay? They really, this was a strong movement within Christianity. It was a reaction against the excesses of rebel theology. What did they believe, all right? Sola Scriptura, sola gratia and sola fide, virgin birth of Jesus Christ, substitutionary atonement, bodily resurrection of Christ, and imminent second coming. And now you look at those and you think, Okay, right? We may we may disagree on substitution or atonement, but but generally speaking, this is this looks pretty good, right? So what's the problem with this? Okay, there's one fundamental problem. Okay, there's and that's the problem. Okay, there's nothing wrong with this really, but that's the problem. Okay, so the issue is that Adventists of those ages, they s had a common enemy with fundamentalists, uh, with uh, a common enemy with fundamentalists against liberal theology. So they said, okay, we'll join forces. And they joined forces. In the process, they learn some fundamentalist theology themselves. Okay, so here is just an example. Uh, there was a book published in uh, Adventist Press, I think it was Pacific, no, it was Southern Press. Uh, Christianity at the Crossroads, Adventist book, okay? And you have a fork in the road, you've got a holy city out there, this man is scratching his head, uh, either fundamentalism or modernism, to the holy city, it says here. He wants to go to heaven, which way do I go? Okay, this is an Adventist book. Which way do I go? Which way is he going to choose? What's the problem with this picture? What's the problem with this picture? Okay, the problem with this picture is there's no third way. The th the, there's no Adventist way. Adventism was different than fundamentalism. Adventism was never fundamentalist kind of a movement. Okay, so Adventism went that way and joined forces. This is another title from Adventist Press. Modernism or fundamentalism, which? And the author argues that it has to be fundamentalism because modernism is destroying, destroying the church, okay? And so on. So that the church joined forces. The problem is that fundamentalists, in addition to those things, they taught verbal inspiration and inerrancy of the scriptures. Basically, as you probably know those things, there are incorrect, incorrect ideas about the authority of the scripture. How we read the scripture and what scripture means to us. With these ideas, this is to cut the long story short, we have entry of something that never existed in Adventism before. It's unhealthy kind of authority, this kind of authority, okay? Fundamentalism has taught this kind of authority. It seeps into Adventism and suddenly we've got this dichotomy between authoritarianism and, and submission. So for many fundamentalist writers of the period, women's place was at home. Raising children, cooking meals for the family, period. Okay, that's what they were writing. Not that those things are wrong in themselves, okay? Uh, raising children is extremely important. My wife spent last 15 years at home, she's doing her PhD now, but she spent 15 years at home raising our kids and doing just that. Doesn't mean it's wrong, but there are seasons in women's life and different women have different gifting, okay? Some women do not have children. So th those are not the only things that God wants women to do, okay? Uh, so as far as uh, fundamentalism is concerned, it brought those kind of ideas into, Christi into Christianity, into Adventism in the, in, in the early 20th century, and we just listened to them. We listened to them and we're beginning to replicate in our periodicals the same kind of thinking, okay? But this is just an example of fundamentalist thinking 
uh, at that time. This is non-Adventist writing. The situation is serious. The satanic instruments, women, seem to stop short of nothing. Like the master who is a murderer from the beginning, they may resort to poison and destroy human life. It is significant how Satan uses women in these closing days of our age. He goads them to perpetuate these wicked actions. Woe to this world when they get the leadership they desire. What was this all about? That was about voting. <laughs> Women wanted to vote. Equal rights as citizens. They wanted to vote. It's a something that you take for granted. I take for granted. I can vote in America just as well. But uh, <laughs> I can't do voting here because I'm on a visa here. I'm, uh, I'm an Australian. Okay? But you can vote here. All right, but this is what fundamentalists were saying about women who wanted to vote. Okay? When a woman assumes the prerogative of power which belongs to the man and seeks to dominate the world or all of its activities as she is doing today, she then possesses the spirit of the beast and is like an angel of light fallen from heaven. This sounds like, like some kind of John Chrysostom or Tertullian, right? This is 20th century, 1915. Okay, George was already alive, right, in 1915? Not quite. Not quite. <laughs> you absolved. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, this is 1915, okay? And simply, women wanted to vote. Okay? Uh, example number two. I have a little book here. This is the title of the book. It's a sad book to read, okay? Uh, it's called Battered into Submission, The Tragedy of Wife Abuse in the Christian Home. Okay, once Christian men learned <coughs> that they are in the position of headship over women, all right, anything goes. Okay, I, it, it's a slippery slope. Okay, that's why it will be so dangerous for us to actually decide on this issue, no to women's ordination, because it's a slippery slope to abuse. That's exactly what happened in, in many Christian homes. I'd like to read you just a, just a little part of it. Okay, I'll have it on the screen so you can follow me and keep awake. But this is a topic about absolute submission, right here in the book, okay? The assumption that the Christian woman's primary responsibility is one of absolute submission to her husband, regardless of what he does or how he acts, is such an automatically accepted tenet of faith for many Christians that is above questioning. The primary responsibility for a good marriage, uh, relation with marriage, asserted Marvin De Han, lies with the wife. If the wife is submissive to her husband, they'll have a good relationship. <laughs> Hello? Lip service may be given to the biblical call for mutual submission in marriage, but most evangelicals writing on the subject of marital roles will concur with John MacArthur, pastor of Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California. In order to, for the family to function in harmony, the woman with no loss of dignity takes the place of submission to the headship of the husband. Now, when you read this now with, with your new glasses, what are we talking about, this or this? Which one? Are you seeing this now? Okay, that's exactly right. What we're seeing here is essentially this. All right, interpreting what it means for a woman to take the place of submission, MacArthur says that the husband alone should work outside of the home. Have you ever heard about John MacArthur, this, this guy? John MacArthur, he's, uh, he still publishes, still works. This is a Grace com Community Church somewhere in California, Sun Valley, California. Okay, it's, he still is there. Uh, basing his interpretation of those verses, he says, I think God is saying that the husband, the standard procedure for a wife and a mother is to work inside and not outside the home. And I think it is all related to the principle of being obedient to your own husband. Okay, uh, basic to... Oh, no, I, miss, I skipped one. Submission should be the welcome response of a Christian woman to their husbands, he charges. If a husband doesn't obey the word, MacArthur counsels the wife to submit, submit anyway. Why? Because without her saying anything, he may be one. And to the woman who is afraid to submit to her husband because he will take advantage of her, MacArthur promises that God will take care of the results if there's any abuse. Wives, as you obey God and submit to your husbands with a gentle and quiet spirit, you can believe God will honor your obedience no matter what. Basic to MacArthur's view of woman's role in marriage is his belief that the woman should not have responsibility equivalent to that of a man because by nature she is weaker and is to be cared for, not left to her own resources. 
The woman is constantly after man's God's given power, he argues. What are we talking about? This is the rotten cucumber. Thank you. You're listening. There. Thank you very much. Very good. Okay, you'll never forget that cucumber, I tell you. Okay, the woman is constantly after man's God's given power because God designed men to be stronger. What an interesting logic. MacArthur's emphasis on power no doubt emanates from his perception of marriage as a potential warfare. Thus, he begins a chapter in his book, The Family, by quoting English World War II Field Marshal Montgomery. Gentlemen, don't even think about marriage until you have mastered the art of warfare. <laughs> you know, this is what many Adventists listen to, okay? Many of our converts today come from fundamentalist kind of churches. All right, and this is the theology they bring with them to Adventism. And I can only say this with uh, Scott Barthy the models of headship to which even many Christian males appeal come straight from the battlefields and corporations of Gentile world. So, let me ask you a question, okay? What is your perception when you think headship? What comes to mind? Male headship, right? What is this or this? Now, if we supply my little cucumber here, this one throw away and take this as a primary understanding of what headship is, male headship, the right? Bible talks about male being a head. What does that mean? Okay, what does that mean? Okay, if you think about headship in terms of rule, control, that requires the submission that you have a far Calvinist, fundamentalist, Catholic kind of understanding of headship, okay? Biblical idea of headship is all about sacrifice. All about sacrifice. And uh, I can speak to the men here. <laughs> yeah, I'm a man. Okay? It's all about sacrificing our ego. Okay? Uh, you exercise biblical headship when you really want something, okay? Especially young men. I'm speaking to young men. I don't know whether old elderly men have the same desires as the young men have. If you really want that new car, okay, or, or new iPod or iPad or something, iPhone, whatever, and, and, and you sacrifice yourself because you feel that your kids need to go to Adventist school or that you need to really provide better for your wife and, and you basically kill your own ego, okay? In my opinion, we males, I, 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 this is my understanding kind of at least, when I look at my wife, it's so easy for her to sacrifice. She sacrifices this and that and that and that. I struggle with that. I have to fight with myself. Okay? I have to work hard to be a good husband. I love my wife absolutely deeply, but when I get to my office and I get to all this interesting stuff, you know, I can forget to come home for supper. You know? <laughs> and, and forget to spend time with my kids. I can forget to, uh, to be a good husband and good father. I have to consciously think about it, make time for it, and, and put my family first. And that's what I think is male headship. It's not ruling over my wife and telling my wife, no, you, have to, you can't go this way. You can't. I have to control your spending. No, it's nothing like this. That's, that's silly. Okay? But this is exactly what Jesus does. did. Jesus did, does not control our free will. Okay? What he does, he supports us. He strengthens us when we come to him. That's, he sacrifices for us. He dies for us. That's the meaning of headship. Christ headship, and that's what I believe we need to, uh, we need to emulate. Okay, I, I find this beautiful verse in the message. Uh, this is translation in Ephesians 5, 25, 28. Listen to this. Husbands, go, out in your, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving. Okay, paradokon is the word, which means self-sacrificing, dying for your wife. Not getting. Christ's husband's love make his, makes the church his wife whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her, dressing her in a dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor since they're already one in the marriage. This is a replacement of wrong idea of headship with a right idea of headship. And it's right in the Bible, okay, right there. And I, 
I, as a husband, I, I try to do that, okay? I, I, I've got a wonderful marriage of 25 years now, and, and I do everything I can in my power to strengthen my family. My family is the most important thing in my life. It's easier now, but at the beginning, I would just go, uh, I was a pastor, you know, I worked for God, I married the church. You know, it's, it, it, that's what it happens. Sometimes we pastors can take another wife, you know, and her name is church. And, and especially if we do Bible studies in the evenings. Right, so, so I, I would stay home, my wife would go to work, uh, my first years of ministry, then, uh, then we would kind of miss each other about 3 or 4 p.m. I would go out to Bible studies and visiting people and enjoying life and everything, you know, if for pastors do, and my wife would be home. And we're just newly married, you know, and I was just gone and coming home at 11, 10, telling her all the stories about winning the world for Christ, you know, and my wife is crying. <laughs> and I think like, what's wrong with you, woman? I, I'm working for Christ, you know, I'm working for the church, why are you crying? I thought there was something wrong with her, you know. You know I didn't have good modeling in my own home. So when I, when I, uh, by, I started my work in January, all right, uh, my first year in 1990, by May we had a major crisis in my family. And I thought it was my wife's fault, because I was working for God. You know, I was called to ministry, I was working for God, I was doing this and doing that and doing that, wonderful work. And finally, I just, I, she cries at home and I just didn't know what to do with her. So finally I decided I need to take her to the counselor. All right, so I made an appointment at the conference. Fortunately, we had a wise Adventist counselor at the conference. I made an appointment. I need to bring my wife so that, that you need to cure her because I don't know what's wrong with the woman. <laughs> okay, so we go together and I'm kind of sympathetically okay, presenting my wife to the counselor, you know, for him to fix her. And he's listening to our story and he looks at my wife and says, you go home. <laughs> okay. I had to spend with the guy Two months until my mind was <laughs> rearranged. Okay, so so that's what it is. You know, Th that's exactly what it is. And and he he really taught me what it means to be a man in the house. Okay, uh, how to love my wife and eventually how to love my children and so on. So uh, the point is the kind of Catholic Calvinist idea of headship extended to the church and influenced our Adventist thinking on ordination of women. Whereas Jesus is the only head of the church. Okay, so here we are. I'm uh, sitting at Tosk in January and I can't believe my ears. Two, three papers talk about male headship in the home, extends to male headship in the church, and all of them are talking this. Figure that, you know, it's in the Bible. Well, what do we do with this? Okay, they talk this. That's the problem. Okay, that's what we're facing. The whole, the whole debate on women's ordination is missing this very point. Okay, so, so here we are. So, no, notice what happened in Adventism, okay? What happened in Adventism? Adventism, unlike the culture, was different, completely different. This is a sample, small sample of what I found about about writing, uh, this is 1859, okay? So this is 1859, 1860, 1871. This is before fundamentalism hit Adventism, okay? Uh, fundamentalism, fundamentalism hits Adventism in the 1890s. This is prior. I know that most of us have been gathered into the message of the third angels from other churches where we received our religious training. And in some of those churches, the prejudice against women's efforts and labors in the church have crushed her usefulness. This kind of training has in many of you caused timidity and discouragement and the neglect of the use of gifts designed to edify the church and glorify God. What kind of, what is he talking about? Edify the church. Right? This is Ephesians 4.11. Okay, apostleship, teaching, administration, and so on. So this is in Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald. Biblical passages have been construed as an objection to women speaking in the public, and thousands of females that have submitted their hearts to God have been deprived of the privilege of speaking out their feelings in the public congregation, to the almost entire loss of enjoyment by false construction put upon those passages. What are we talking about? We're talking hermeneutics. How do you interpret? What kind of passages? He's talking about women shall have no authority, and women shall be silent. This is false. Okay, that's what he says. Notwithstanding the great amount of evidence that can be brought to prove that all who are made partakers of such love have right to speak forth their praises, then let no stumbling block be thrown in their way, but let them feel the place that God wants them to feel. 
Advent Review in Sabbath Herald 1860. When women are forbidden to speak for Christ, the spirit of the gospel is violated. And this is just scratching the surface. This was the literature of our church until Ellen White died. Once she died, we turned fundamentalist in this issue, okay? So it came to that that in 1881, they ca the resolution came to the general conference that all candidates for license and ordination should be examined with reference to their intellectual and spiritual fitness for the successful discharge of the duties which will devolve upon them as licentiates and ordained ministers. Resolved that females possessing the necessary qualifications to fill that position may, with perfect propriety, be set apart by ordination to the work of the Christian ministry. This was a general conference resolution. Of course, general conference was probably no bigger than this, this room right now at that stage, okay? There were just few people. They resolved it. They put it into the higher committee. But at that stage, in 1881, they were fighting all kinds of issues, like it's Sunday laws and everything. This was put on a shelf, and they never got back to it. By the time maybe somebody thought to go back to it, it was all forgotten, and fundamentalism was at force. Okay, so this never happened, unfortunately. If we dealt with this issue then, oh man, we would have a different world today. Okay, it, it would have been wonderful, but, but, but we didn't. Okay, so I have a sample here that I'm going to quit here because I would like to have a discussion about all the women that, uh, that did all kinds of service in for the church. And I'll just stop at uh, the last one here. One after another who pastored and ministered and, and they did the work of the gospel. Okay, one after another. But this is the one I'd like to read. This is the last one. One of the most successful ministers in New York State at the time. Lulu's ministry began when she was licensed as a minister in 1897. The results for, from Whiteman's ministry rank her not only as the most outstanding evangelist in New York during her time, but probably among the most successful within the Seventh-day Adventist Church for any time period. Raised a total of 17 churches. In New York State alone, SDA churches established by this woman include those churches. Okay? And this is, this is still before fundamentalism hit. In 1897, Pastor S.M. Cobb wrote to the New York Conference president, she has accomplished more the last two years than any minister in this state. I am in favor of giving license to Sister Lulu Whiteman to preach, and if Brother Wiseman, Whiteman is of ability and works with his wife and promises to make a successful laborer, I am in favor of giving him license also. Okay, <laughs> well, there you go, okay. So, notice the dates, okay, all those dates were the women before the turn of the 20th century. After the 20th century turned in, especially after 1915, the, you know what happened in 1915? Ellen White dies, okay. Ellen White dies. As I said to you yesterday, one of the gentlemen who is on the task blames Ellen White for all the troubles we have right now because Adventists had to defend women speaking now because of Ellen White and we wouldn't have a problem if God chose another prophet. Why did he choose a woman? Uh, he's, he's upset with this. We've got, all right. All right, so, uh, so anyway, what, what happens, okay, what happens here is that our church started listening to this kind of literature uh, from fundamentalists and... Uh, the women's participation in the gospel work plummeted, drastically plummeted. Uh, and uh, then we have a rise of women's lib in the women's liberation, feminism, secular feminism in, in the 60s and 70s. And now those of us who try to see women in ministry are all blamed that we're listening to a cultural agenda. No, there's nothing, nothing to do with that. There's, there are other reasons, okay? Uh, absolutely not. So, you know, I think that if we listen to Jesus and, and had this kind of authority in mind and not replace this with this, we would have many more women like this. What would, what, where would we be as an Advent movement if we didn't listen to foreign agendas? Where would we be? What a loss, you know? I'm amazed that God, God's been patient so long, okay? But, but what, a, what a terrible loss, okay? I bet that some of those churches that she established would not have a woman preacher today. You know, I'm pretty certain of this. Not so with you.
not so with you. Okay, we've got a few more minutes, so I'll conclude shortly. But can you say it with me? Not so with you. Remember this, okay? Two, two things. Not so with you, all right? That's the bottom line. It would solve many of our problems. I'm pretty certain of this. So what's, what's there to, to be left, okay? I call it in my classes reconstruction because what I did yesterday is deconstruction. Okay, we well, deconstruct the false ideas of, of, uh, of all, all those false ideas. We need to reconstruct. And part of the re reconstruction of my sermon today, is this, this afternoon, is the second part. What can we say about theology of ministry? This is very, very briefly. You know, in the New Testament, ministry is related to giftedness, not a position. Whoever has a gift, they do it. If I tell a woman, you're a woman, you may have a gift, but you're a woman, no, then I'm killing the Holy Spirit. For me, it's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Why would a Holy Spirit give a gift of leadership to a woman if she's not supposed to exercise it? You know, it, it's, it's bizarre. I, I don't quite understand. When, when you look at the gifts, okay, I could take you, uh, I take my students on a, a little bit of a exegesis of Romans 12, 1 to 8, when we have uh, the spiritual gifting. There is a gift of leadership in there, gift of management, tucked in uh, around the gifts of mercy. Just read this verse 8. Around the gifts of mercy, around the gifts of uh, giving, helping. And one of them is leadership. And the interesting thing is, that the word leadership or management that is used in the verses, verse 8, is once again used in 1 Timothy 5.17, where it says the leaders, the, the, the elders who stand before the church are worthy of double honor. Okay, the leaders who manage the church. Same word, it's a gift. Okay, it's a gift. All right, uh, nowhere in the scriptures we do find that gifts are ranked, this gender can have this gift, this gender has this gift. It's just not there, unless you read it with glasses of male headship. And then you will say, all right, okay, okay. Women can have gift of mercy, but leadership, no. And it doesn't make any sense, because they read with different kind of, uh, different kind of glasses. So what is my theology of ministry? We're coming to an end here. Wouldn't you agree with this? Every believer is minister. I think we did a disservice to the church by creating a distinction between laity and clergy. I think it's a problem. All right? Every believer is a minister. Functions in the church must be based on spiritual gifting. If they not, we are in big trouble. Spiritual gifting should be the prerequisite for laying on of hands. Absolutely. We should practice laying on of hands. I, I wish we practice laying on of hands more often. I wish the church leaders, especially those who teach children, they should have their hands laid on, you know. I, I find this really ironic and bizarre and strange that I go into PMC, I attend PMC church. Pastor Dwight is a wonderful preacher. You've heard Pastor Dwight. We, he's a good preacher, okay. He, he does a good job. My child sits in that sermon for half an hour a week, if that, because sometimes he doesn't preach, that's the only contact that ordained pastor has with my child. And my child goes to Adventist school and an Adventist teacher is teaching her Bible seven, five days a week. Okay, For a few hours the contact is there and we do not lay hands on our teachers. How bizarre is this? You know, I just don't understand this. Uh, why don't we lay hands on people who lead Sabbath schools? for Sabbath schools for our children here. I mean, this is an amazing ministry. And we just don't, don't, lay, don't, don't separate those people. Uh, but we focus on pastor because he's more equal than everybody else. You know, uh, this is like bizarre. Okay, it is, it, for me, it is unbiblical. So that I believe that we should, we should practice this a little bit more and, and not, not make it of such high importance. Professional commission ministry, is it wrong to have professional ministry? No, I think that Pastor John is a great pastor here and he helps this church. And I think partly because of his personality and his gift in this church is thriving. It's okay, I mean, he dedicates his full life to this, okay? It is absolutely all right. But, but and the ministry of other believers have the same goal. We are the same kind of people edifying the church through our gifting. 
Spiritual gifts must always remain foundational to the professional ministry. Okay, not gender, spiritual gifts. It's all throughout the New Testament. The whole, the whole picture of, of the church. All right, what is the most prominent picture of the church in the New Testament? You tell me. What is it? What is church, according to Paul? A it's a body. Thank you very much. Body of whom? Christ. Body of Christ. Okay, and what is Paul saying about the body of Christ? If I cut off this finger, what's going to happen? All right, my hand is not going to function properly anymore. Okay, we need everybody, gifts of every person in the church. I mean, the whole image of the body of Christ, there's no gender distinction. This is a female finger and this is a male finger, and this one is more important than this. Crazy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just not there. So spiritual gifting is very much foundational. Okay, I've got three more, couple of more, two more slides, three more slides, and, and we'll end here. So we need to ask ourselves, and we've been asking ourselves at the Theology of Ordination Study Committee, what is the meaning of the laying on of hands of ceremony? I don't even like to call it ordination anymore. What is the meaning? Second question, who qualifies for the right of laying on of hands? And the third question, who should lay hands on the believers set apart for special ministry? All right, I've got three very short, brief answers to those questions. What is the meaning of laying on of hands? It is confirmation and a blessing. You have a gift, go for it. You are a teacher in a school, it's your spiritual gifting to be a teacher for the children. We will lay hands on you, go. This is your missionary field. In the Bible, in the New Testament, missionaries were ordained. Ordained, <laughs> laid, commissioned. Commission is much better words, all right? Uh, I would like to be commissioned rather than ordained. It's just a simple <laughs> blessing simple ordination. Uh, interestingly enough, this is the Tosk statement that we came up with last year. I was part of the group that we actually came up with this five people from opposition, five people who really wanted ministry uh, uh, of women. We just, what can we agree on? This is finally after many, 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 many hours of talk Definition of ordination. Seventh-day Adventists understand ordination in a biblical sense as the action of the church in publicly recognizing those whom the Lord has called and equipped for local and global church ministry. Any problems with this? No. So we vote this in July 2013. In January, they come back with male headship. <laughs> you know, I don't understand this. I don't understand how, how can we go the direction after voting this good statement. Okay, this is, and this is, this is kind of spreads the ordination around. So, second question. Who qualifies? Okay, who qualifies for laying an offense? Anyone. Thank you. You got it. Okay, anyone in whom the church recognizes particular gifting. Anyone. Okay, anyone. This is an important point. It is not my place to decide on whom the Holy Spirit can and cannot bestow certain gifts. If I do, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Because I basically take position above him. And I say, no, no, no. Okay? Uh, well, I can understand one thing, all right? That the church can recognize that this man or this woman does not have a particular gifting for this particular task. But we cannot make a gender distinction in this issue. It's impossible. Because we cannot dictate to the Holy Spirit. We can't do it, okay? And a third question, last question, who should lay hands on other believers? Well, you should know the answer to this question after yesterday's lecture. The whole church, in my humble opinion. Not just ordained individuals, but the whole church. Remember that next time you have ordination in your church, ask that the whole church should lay hands. Right? Maybe lay hands, sit in pews, but lay hands on one another up to the front and so on. When there is an uh, elders uh, laying on of hands ceremony or, or deacons or, or Bible teachers, I, I would hope we would do that. Oh my, I would hope that we would, we would lay hands on our Bible teachers in, in, in school. But you know, part of the problem is that some of the Bible teachers in Adventist schools are females. We can't lay hands on females. <laughs> so we don't lay hands on anyone. Oh, the whole church, all right? Final word, final slide. No, I don't want this slide. Okay, this is a good slide, but I'll, I'll put this one. When a great and decisive work is to be done, God chooses men and women to do this work, and it will see the loss if the talents of both are not 
combined. Thank you very much.